Welcome to, again, me. It's been a while. Uh, what I'm going to do today is drink some stuff, stay fueled, and we're going to look at, I'm going to try to reverse engineer a bit of a Blazor application and look at some of the data that's available in the Blazor application and provide or build out a backend that will provide that data via GraphQL uh, API endpoint. So that's, that's what we're going to do today. Nothing super fancy, nothing really crazy, just that. Oh, with that said, I've reconfigured all the things. So all the things are in different places. For instance, ah, here we go. Here's the, here's the screen. And why something's wrong. I'm going to fix it real quick. Oh, there we go. I see what's wrong. So OBS loses the video camera in certain states. There I am. Okay. So with me now on screen, uh, we're going to get rolling here. Uh, so, oh yeah, one, one other thing, because, you know, you're on my stream. So we're going to listen to some pretzel. Uh, you know, we'll listen to the metal station. And, uh, oh, I don't, I don't know if you'll hear it, actually. Oh, which is the button. Don't worry, I'm going to share this gloriousness with you in just a moment. Um, if you're curious on the Mac, it's really weird. You have to have this extra thing installed and set up a uh, multiple output device. There, I've got uh, my headphones on. I don't know why I do that. I uh, live in the house. I can listen to the music as loud as I want to. And it's a little loud for you too, so I'm going to turn it down. There we go. With a little metal going, we're now going to get get rolling here. That shouldn't be too loud. If it is, anybody can't hear me over it, let me know, and I'll fiddle with it. <laughs> anyway. All right. All right, all right, all right. Okay, in the web application, shared directory. I know there is it there, or let's see here. i got to find it. Ah, models. Food item. This is what I need to model. I need to provide a data back in for this. Seems pretty straightforward, right? We got a GUID, a name, person, the vegetarian, and gluten free. I and mean, I believe this is this is like the item, a food item. And this is a food list. And this is the data source that we need to be able to provide. So pretty pretty straightforward. Um, I'm in IntelliJ IDA idea however they say that so i'm going to use that and i'm going to add a directory but since this is another individual's repo i'm going to be polite and set up a branch first so first i'm going to check my git see where i'm at oh well, a bunch of stuff happened because it, it wanted a, a a key or whatnot so i'm going to actually do git actually let's do git checkout uh, dash B makes you move into the branch that you're about to create. You check it out and just create the branch. Um, and we're going to call it Adrian's uh, data tier. Oops, let's call it Adrian's graph QL data tier. There we go. So now we're on that. And I'm going to actually reset all those bits. So then get status. Oh, I thought it would I thought it would chunk all that stuff. But anyway, in in my branch, first thing I believe I want to do is actually let's add a git ignore so I don't accidentally add a bunch of stuff that somebody else isn't want to going to want to have. So I'm going to go down and create a git ignore. Where is it? Ignore git ignore. And gonna go with, let's see here. We're gonna want, I think, Visual Studio. A, B, C, D, F, L, M, B, Q, R, S, T, U, V. There's Visual Studio, so we'll do that one. Because this is a Blazor app and I believe an Azure function. So I want to make sure to 
knock out all these dependencies that I might accidentally add. Then I'm also going to want a, let's see here, what am I going to want? Not too much else beyond that. I'm going to scroll down. Oh yeah, and I'll add Mac OS. So that should, yeah, that adds the DS Store. And then let's add the Windows just to keep that stuff out. Oh, and Visual Studio Code. I feel like there's one other thing. Eh, that's good enough though. Let's generate that with all that good stuff. I'll go add it to the repo. And there we go. Okay, so there's our file. And then one more thing. I'm going to actually add that IDA directory. Um, and then, did it re restarted the song. Why did it do that? I don't want that one either. There we go. So maybe that won't do the weirdness of restarting things now. Who knows? Oh, and it looks like Pretzel Rocks is actually updating the chat now. That's quite amazing. Uh, it hadn't been doing that for weeks for me. So anyway, all right, we got all our IDEA dot get ignore files stuff done. So I'm going to do that. Then let's do a get status again. Yeah, so that blocked out all that stuff that was generated before when I do the test execution of the web application. Um, I did that with JetBrains Writer, which you can open up and you know run all those projects with right here, which when I ran that, what I got was, stop and rerun here, we'll take a look just real quick at the user interface that this gives us. And let's see here, this is this is running in Safari. And I like, can go down to the food item list and I added some stuff here. And then I'll add something else like Kelly is gonna bring some chicken. Oh, I did it backwards, so let's do Kelly is going to add some chicken, and it's going to be, you know, it's going to be vegetarian and gluten-free chicken. I have no idea what this is, but there we go. So that's basically what we have, right? So now I'm going to work on building out a GraphQL backend so that we can have this GraphQL backend for our application here. I'm going to close Rider and just use IDEA to do my work. I believe there would be no problem whatsoever with using Writer, but I'm more familiar with some of the tidbits that I have in IntelliJ, and I know I have the plugins installed, so I'm gonna use it. Also, hello, Viable Clan member, it is good to see you again. Uh, by the way, how's my volume level? Is it too loud? I mean, it is metal, I don't know why I would ask if it's too loud, but, you know, just trying to make sure that you can hear me too. All right, so we got our get ignore. We have that in there. Now let's get into the meat of this. All right, status, git add. Oops, I'm messing that up. Let's hear git status. There we go. There's all our all our stuffs. Let's see here. And then the the git ignore is in there, right? Yeah, new file git ignore. So let's add that git commit adding the git ignore with goodies. Get status, then let's see, can I get rid of this stuff? Gets reset hard, get status. Yeah, okay, I got rid of most of it. Oh, and then an ID added for that. Why did it not? Yeah, I don't want either one of those things. Let's actually, I'm gonna be super harsh and do this. I'm gonna remove the web application.ida directory. That should just leave me the one to deal with. And then I'm gonna get, no, I'm gonna, rmrf.ida like that. That's going to cause havoc in a minute. But then if I do this, I should have nothing to fight with. And let's make sure that... Oh, I didn't... I must not have saved it with that. Damn it, that's what the problem was. I was getting ready to fight with this thing. Alright, so let's see. Here, get add... Last minute git ignore edition. All right, so now that we got that done. Oh, and four gathers, thanks for the follow. Welcome, welcome to the mosh pit. Uh, I am adding 
a data tier here, and we're just about to get into the meat of it, so uh, sorry if you're vegetarian, but it's going to get gory. All right, so I have a thing installed. It's the Hasura CLI, so if I type Hasura, it's going to show you what the CLI does. This is a tool that works for the Hasura API that allows you to initialize a directory that provides migrations, metadata, and seed information, at least where you would store those things, where you can then use those things to work against your Hasura API and the data model that you would create. In this particular situation, um, I am going to type in Hasura init to get that started. There we go. So now I can navigate into that. If I do a quick git status check, you'll see there's it says that this directory is new, so let's go ahead and add the directory. Now if I do a git status, you can see there's all the pertinent things that I just added by doing git init. I have a metadata directory now, and shortly I will have other things in this directory, such as when I actually get migrations and seeds added to those, those directories. And of course, if you're curious, when you do a git add, it doesn't add empty directories. You don't get to add directories until they have stuff in them. So just a little bit of tidbit about git for you. All right, so now that I've done git, I mean, Hasura init, I need to get the, uh, the Docker file that I always use. And this is something I feel like I've done 8 million times, but I'll do it one more time just so everybody sees everything that I do here. So I'm gonna type in Hasura, quick, quick start, uh, Docker. And then in here, Fauna always got their ads stuck right above that and it's not useful to this anyway I'm gonna grab it via curl and it's just it's just a YAML file for using docker compose to spin up something locally for us to use right and that is what I want to do at this point so I'm gonna paste where's what's my paste key there dad burn it there's my paste key so I'm gonna get that now we have our Docker compose file right there and get that down here Let's go in here and look at our Docker Compose file. All right, the first thing I want to do, because most things are set up just fine, I'm going to add some ports to open up my Postgres database so that I can do certain things with it locally, like actually execute SQL against it and things like that, and use even things like the, the data grip tool. All right, there we go. Uh, is my video skipping? It's gonna really piss me off if that's doing that. I have an EGP, EGPU, wow, I can't talk, EGPU attached to this stupid laptop that OBS should be using. If it's not, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, get, I'm gonna get upset. Throw something out a window. Let me, well, I'm going to keep going. If it gets choppy, then, well, it's choppy. All right, so what do we have here? Uh, let's see if I do, let me actually do that. See, here's the thing. I'm going to show everybody real quick. So if I open up my applications, one of the things when you add a GPU to your machine, and you go in, ah, there we go, OBS app. If I right click, go to get info, it says prefer external GPU. So it should be running stuff via the GPU instead of attempting to run it on the machine. And it appears to be because when I run video or anything else on a Mac laptop, uh, the fan goes crazy. It's, it's a lot of intensive work for the local fan to work on but it looks like my face is skipping regardless on the monitor so hopefully you can still get my audio and see what I'm actually doing because I'm gonna keep rolling and even if it looks like my video is going okay so even if it gets a bit choppy on this I'll post the good video that I'm recording locally to YouTube and I can guarantee, like from the looks of it, it's recording flawlessly. So you'll see all of my head bobs and babblings without any error. So I'm going to keep rolling. And if anything, if it gets a little bad, just check out the VOD later. 
All right, enough of that. Okay, we got the Docker Compose. I'm gonna see what I'm running here. Docker, Docker PS. Okay, nothing's running. That is what I expected, what I wanted. So I'm going to run Docker Compose up dash D. Then over here, in this in this file real quick, here's my Postgres password, and it's gonna use the Postgres account. If we scroll down here, we can see, using the Postgres, with Postgres password as the password, to log into the database, right? What is, what is dash E? Did I do dash E or dash D? So actually, I'll, I'll talk about that for a second. So if I do, God, I can't type it, docker compose down, right? That'll bring it down. Cool, Thank, thanks Mike J. I don't know, it might just be uh, Safari tripping on the video or something stupid. Maybe I should bring up my Chrome browser for monitoring. But anyway, so when I ran Docker, there's Docker up, or doc, sorry, Docker compose up. And that'll actually bring things bring things up, right? But here, here's the qualm with this. It's all great and groovy, but watch. Actually, it might even do it differently now. But traditionally, if you just run Docker compose up, the whole active logs of all the instances of whatever it is, that all the container instances that you're bringing up, yeah, see, you get the log dumped out into the terminal, which is fine if you want to see the logs, but in this case, I, don't, I just want them up. I don't really want to look at the logs while things are executing. This is a great way to tag and then track when things are being executed that are going to show up in the log, right? But... I, I'm not doing that. Like I know these, I know the GraphQL engine and I know Postgres are going to run without any real problems. So if I needed to troubleshoot that, I would do it this way. But otherwise, I'm just doing, oops, if I hit control C, it does like a force stop and then it stops the containers. But if I do docker compose up dash D, then dash D throws it on a background thread, right? So docker up, oops, docker compose up dash D. And then you just get this. It tells you that it starts, gives you the second counter over there. And as soon as that's done, uh, that's all you get, boom. And you get, you get response back to your terminal um, and it's on a background thread running now. So like if I run Docker PS though, I can see and, and get a check on you know, the, the container instances that are running. So that's, that is what that is doing for me. All right, so that's running. Um, and I open the port uh, right here, 5432, and I checked the pass Postgres password because what I'm going to do is use this editor because I like to look at my database and come in here, find Postgres, and then in this, I actually will download the driver because I haven't gotten it yet, but then I just add Postgres. It's already pointed at localhost where this is going to appear to be running. It is in the Docker container, but to the local system, right, the, the, in this case, Mac OS itself, it looks like Postgres is running localhost. It also looks like Hasura is running localhost. However, neither are running on the localhost. They're running on the container that appears to the system to be localhost. Uh, so we can get more into that on another day. There's the port, by the way. And this is Postgres password. So that's in there now. I'm gonna apply that, test the connection, should get a green. Yep, there we go, all right, that's good. So, okay, and then let's take a look. Just, just to show everybody, um, the way you have to do this, you come in and you like click these things to get, to get the databases, right? Now, control is another database that I actually have added autonomous to that, so we're gonna pretend that's not there because when you go get a Postgres image, that you're not gonna have a control database. You're just gonna have the default Postgres database, right? And that's fine for this example because that's what we're gonna use. Now, at this point, uh, that all looks good and I, I know I have access to the database, but now I'm gonna go add the thing that we actually want to add by typing Hasura console. Now Hasura console is going to launch. It's gonna use the config YAML file here and this config YAML file is going to point at the localhost 8080. Okay, 
it's going to point at that, but it's going to instantiate another local host instance of something executing on the local machine. Not super important to notice that nuance immediately, but I'll show you why that's important in just a second. So when I execute Hasura console, it's going to use this connection to connect to. So like if you had a remote one that's out somewhere on the internet, you could use Hasura console and just change this, or you can pass the endpoint to it like this. So there, there is a switch. I'm just gonna keep it simple, execute Hasur console and let it use the config options. Now, it's gonna bring up a interface, which I'm just grabbing off my other screen because it stuck it way over there. Um, and the interface is gonna look like this, right? Now, again, it has a few bits. Notice the system core, which is in a flaky state because it's something that I did previously. So what we're gonna wanna do though is at this point, we're gonna manage this. There's no actual database connection because we haven't added one. And here's where things get a little tricky. Notice when I typed Hasura console, it executes that from locally on the local machine 9695. And it needs to point to wherever the actual server is running. The server also runs a console. So if I change this to 8080, we're gonna get the active console that we're actually looking at from the server instance we're running. I know, it's a little bit complicated. We're gonna make it simpler. But for now, you just need to know that those are in two different places. And then I'll show you why I use the Hasura console. <laughs> yeah, so you know what I'm talking about, Viable Clan member. Um, it's a little tricky, but here's, here's the cool part. So what I'm gonna do first is I'm gonna go ahead and add the default connection. This is the one thing that I'm gonna need to do with the localhost 8080 console. Right, so I'm gonna add that and then we'll do the database URL, then bounce back over to IntelliJ. I'm gonna go in my Docker Compose file and find the, what am I finding? I'm losing track of myself. Oh yeah, the, the connection string, which is just right here. Now you'll notice there's these that are already in here. This Hasura GraphQL metadata database URL is a connection string that the system needs to know because it always has a default Postgres database where it puts all its metadata. The secondary one is one you can add and either by environment variable or by the URL string to connect and put our, we use that to put our user data in. So I'm gonna actually change this midstream here. We're gonna, we're gonna use the environment variable instead of the URL. And by doing that, since that container has that environment variable, click on that add it here, make sure that's still in. We're gonna to connect to that database. So now we're connected. It shows the connection right here. The connection string is just the environment variable. And that just points at the local container instance and its environment variable, which has the Postgres URL connection string in it. So we're all set, good to go. We have our database connection. And since we have our database connection now, we can actually do this cool thing and not use the 8080 console anymore, right? Because if any changes we make at this point, they're not gonna be saved in any way, form, or manner, right? Uh, except on the server one time. So we won't have anything like a migration or something like that to actually be able to recreate this environment for like another developer. So I'm sharing this with another developer, so I want them to have migrations, metadata, and other information to be able to recreate it on their local machine to do development. Also, low code TV, welcome to the stream. Thanks for the raid. Glad to see everybody here. We are putting together a basic GraphQL data model on Hasura, and I just got a local instance of Hasura up and running using Docker. So, pog, 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 pog. Hey, yo. What, what were y'all just doing on the stream? I'm super curious. Low code TV sounds pretty awesome. Like I probably need to be following you and I'm not yet, am I? Uh, so yeah, let, let me know. I'm very curious. Um, in the meantime, we're gonna keep rolling ahead here and maybe we'll take a look at the low code TV stuff here in just a second and give y'all a shout out. Oh, it's still a chat channel. So keeping it low, low code with some chat chat. That's cool, works for me. Still check it out a little later. Um, all right, so we're at 8080, but I'm going to bounce over, and I'm gonna do it the lazy way, and just relaunch what I did with Hasura console. So that's gonna spin that 
it's gonna look it's gonna look the same thing it's gonna spin up effectively the same thing it's just local instead of out on that server that's on the container right all right so we got we got this it's it's largely empty let's build our data model so in here I'm going to skip creating a schema I'm gonna keep it in our standard public schema that we start with by default so let's see here I'm gonna click on it and once you click on it, this changes to create table because once you're in a schema in Postgres, you can create a table in that schema. So let's create our first one. So we'll call this our food, food items. Hmm, is that a good one? Let's look back at our data model that we have, that we that we got from our fellow cohort. Okay, so models. Oh well, there's the. Is this the same thing? Yeah, pretty much the same thing. All right, so we got an ID, which is gonna be a UUID, and it is called food item. Okay, and then we got name, person, vegetarian, and gluten-free. All pretty much strings and two bulls, okay? So let's do, we'll keep it named food items. We'll add in an ID, which, oh, actually, I know, we can use this. And it'll go ahead and pre-populate our function to get a random UUID whenever we are creating a new value. It will need to be unique and will be unique because it's a UUID. And then we're going to name it. Um, and that's going to be for the food item itself. So like chicken or veggies or whatever it is. Veggie dish, something like that. So string, which will be, there we go, text. Um, and then we'll want, was it person, I think? Yeah, person. Leave that as text. And then we got vegetarian and gluten-free. So vegetarian, boolean, and gluten-free. Whoops, free boolean also. And let's give some default values of, well, this is Postgres, so we can just write false, I believe. And then for good measure, because we like to be thorough, I want to create it at and an updated at column, just so that we can have audit capabilities on our data. These are things that we don't have to add to the user interface. It can just be for us back-end database administrators. You know, whenever, whenever the feds come and ask us what all our super secret information is about our food items. So we're ready. Um, and the ID is also something that won't really be posted out there for people to look at. The main things are gonna be name, person, vegetarian, and gluten-free. All that's ready, let's add that table. Boom, all right. So we got that, so now let's take a look at the API. We'll use Graphicule to just get a query. Actually, we'll start with an insert here. So let's do a mutation. And then insert a food, let's, let's insert one food item. Let's see, what's, we're gonna return we we'll want to see the ID, and then I like to see the created at, and then we'll just uh, then we'll look. We'll get the the basic data that we just added. Ah, there we go. Vegetarian. All right, and then over here we want to add our object. The values we're going to add are just name, person. Is it vegetarian or not? And is it gluten-free or not? So you can see it defaulted already to false. So let's do chicken catch e tori. <laughs> um, and that's gonna be me. And that is gonna, this is gonna actually be gluten-free, right? So 99% sure that's gluten-free. Definitely not vegetarian, because it has food, uh, chicken in it. And then we're going to execute this mutation to add that record. There we go. Boom. So now we see our ID that was generated by the database from the function that was set as the default. It is gluten-free. It is not vegetarian. There's me. There's my fancy chicken catchy Tory name. And then the created at date, which right now created at and updated at will be the exact same values, which is why I only return from this the created at value. Now, whenever we add this to the database, this is the type of thing that we can return because with GraphQL, there's always the assumption that we're trying to minimize the number of trips back and forth to the database. With SQL, traditionally what we would have to do is send the insert 
and then do an entirely new query with a select to ask for that pertinent data that we just got back. With GraphQL though, we don't have to do that. We're already getting it back by default. So then we can take action on that data. However, if you don't want all that data back, you can just do something like uh, just ID and just ignore it or something like that. If you're doing multiple inserts, such as using the food items in food insert food items function, which will allow you to do multiple objects, pass in multiple objects in an array, um, you can get back just the affected rows like that. So here in objects, see it says object here. Here in objects though, you could put in a list of those objects and it would add those. We're not gonna do that at the moment though. We're just gonna do that one singular item and then let's do a query and just see for ourselves that the food items are indeed there. There's name, person, and then vegetarian and gluten-free. There we go. So there's, there's our data. So that should be enough to get started with attaching the application to this backend. And the API endpoint is available right there. All you got to do is spin it up with a Docker Compose like I have done. Um, we're using that interface, but I'm going to I'm going to kill it real quick. We'll move that. And I'm going to, whoops, take a look at one other thing to show you. So one of the things that we just did was, oh, let me, I dorked up some video stuff. There it is. Okay, fixed it. All right. So what we just did was we added that, got the API set up, and it'll launch. We can launch it very easily. We just Docker Compose up, and it's going to be there, right? Now, for my friend that I'm working with, uh, what he'll have to do to get this up and running is do that Docker Compose, but locally he won't have the database with my special item in the database yet. So the way he would need, what he would need to do to get that is execute some migrations, which I have created, and you didn't even see me create it, because the user interface, the Hasura console user interface, the one that launches locally, it actually created these migrations for me. So here is our table, food items table, with that ID set to use the generate random UUID function, name, and so on. And the function is also created to set the current timestamp so that it can always calculate when the column was last updated, whenever a column, I mean, whenever a row of data is being updated. So if I go in and like change my name or change the name of the recipe, then that item would be changed and the updated at column would show the most recent update time of the update. Um, sounds a little redundant there saying a lot of updates and updates and updates, but that's what this does. It lets you know when the record was last updated. And all that was done through the user interface whenever I was in there clicking around just adding that table. So whenever you add tables, you add the relationships, you set the relationships to show from the metadata and the GraphQL, all that stuff can be added via the migrations. And then that's specifically for the database and the metadata is what stores the information for the Hasura, the GraphQL, so the GraphQL knows those correlations in the GraphQL schema itself. So now, all you have to do is query the API with your application with, with whatever GraphQL queries you wanna execute, whether they're mutations, uh, you got subscriptions, you know, any of that stuff. You can do whatever you want. So, we have our backend built. So now I'm gonna to try to play around and see if I can do something else here. I don't know if I'll be able to. I might have to uh, ask my buddy Jeremy to show me what he's got set up here because I, I don't particularly know. So the web application, I have to use JetBrains Writer for it and I currently have JetBrains IDE or IDEA. Let's see, I gotta click on the other screen and it's, it's starting on my other screen. Don't worry, I'll bring it over here and we'll look at it. But what I'm gonna do is get the other screen. I don't, there, there it goes. Oh, and it's opening back here where it's supposed to be. Multiple monitors, y'all. It's a, it's, a, it's a thing, it's kind of a problem sometimes and, and a great advantage at the same time. All right, so we got that model here 
And we got uh, Razor. Oh, that's this is like a view. So this is gonna take me a minute. Have patience. I know the back end. I don't always know the front end. Oh, and here's where the the food items are parsed through. Looks like. Oh, and it sets up like a table record. All right, name of food, person bringing it, vegetarian, gluten-free, action, something, something. So here is then some code that does the food items, display message, response, HTTP client, base URL. Yeah, so I don't, I don't know where, oh, we deleted something. So like if I, if I run this though, boop, executing. Here we go. So this is this is the web application. Now let me, let me get it on the screen right. There we go. So if we click web application, what happens? No. About. Well, that does a thing. That goes to the about page. Well, anyway, so home and then a oh, food item. So there's no food items yet, but like I just showed that a little earlier. And if I execute this. Well, let's go actually, so this is the food item, and then the pages. So those are like views. That's the model, right? So this is our food item model. Let's see what it's doing now. I think, is this the, anybody know anything about Blazor? <laughs> um, I don't exactly know the model. Where did my monitor went off? Oh, that's because it's right here. Y'all are right here. All right, there we go. If anybody knows anything about Blazor, this would be a great time to tell me. Where, where's a good place to set a breakpoint so we can figure out where and how this is writing stuff? That's my question, right? So if I type like other chicken dish, Frankie, um, we're going to add that food. So it's added. I know it executed, right? And in the back end here, here's this stuff. So listening on localhost, this port, 5,000. It started, and then content root path. But I don't know where to put the breakpoint. Maybe in here? Maybe in program? Builder services. Add scoped. Add. So that's the web application task. From the look of it, it instantiates a new HTTP client, builds things, and then waits for responses. So I'm assuming that is the server. That's nothing, appears to be. Maybe in here. No, that's just the root HTML page, right? Yeah. Just HTML st stuff. And it loads the web assembly. So in the survey prompter does that. Okay, I'm not worried about that. And I mean, you main layout index. No, nope. okay. Food item list. Ah, this is probably it. So let's see here. We're de deleting food item. Let's just, let's do an add food item. Oh, here we go. Add, add food item. This is, ah, this is what I was looking for. So we get a client, new HTTP client, base request, base URL. It should be response, message, response. So there's our payload. It's our food item. Name, food item, person, etc. So that stuff comes from here. Oh, properties on the page. Okay. I guess that somehow gets it out of the web page properties. I don't particularly know. Um, but we're going to figure it out here. So that gets the payload. And then here, let's put a breakpoint. We get this string content, JSON serializer. What? <laughs> response, something, something, display item, display message, response status code string. Okay. And then there's delete food item. There. And where is it? So delete async. So it's writing it to some URL that's storing the data. But I don't know what it... It's pulling that from so response 
because the web page is being the client and this code, even though it's not JavaScript, Blazor allows this code to execute effectively from the web page, right? The web page or the web assembly is, is calling and executing this in some way, which I guess is probably rendered or written out in JavaScript on the actual page. So response.content is object at response, blah, 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 blah. Content await this thing read as string async. Oh, there's, so this is food items and it's derived from this JSON serializer that's taking the content, which is, is that a oh, response.content? Yeah, okay, so and it's calling against the base address. And the base address is the base URL, which is, let's see here, can I go to, I don't really expect, I wanna go, yeah, go to derive symbol implementation to type declaration. Yeah, I think type declaration. Oh, we're going somewhere. No, I don't wanna decompile anything. Where is, where is this defined? Maybe I don't wanna do that. I just wanna do, let's do implementation. Oh, there we go. So it's a private constant string. And this is the thing. Oh, okay, okay. Wait. Jeremy, I'm sorry if I'm writing to your stuff, my friend. I did not mean to do that. But then of course, you didn't put security on it, so I don't know. <laughs> what is what is this though? Food item. Oh yeah, there is something there. Other other chicken dish. Person Frankie. So that that just going to that site, going to that URL has my uh, data that I put in there. So it's out getting put out there in some database using some mechanism. So I imagine that there's probably because I know there's a function in here, right? Whoops, I closed all of it. But anyway, we're going to go back to our writer. There we go. So in this repo, actually go back to IntelliJ. See, there's also a function app. And I bet if I look in that, yeah, that looks like it. This is probably what's storing and either adding or deleting all, all of the bits. So that's, that's cool. Um, so that would need to execute against a bit. But this is running out on Azure is what the deal is. So we'll find out more about that. But I think what we can do immediately is let's, let's get these out of the way. All right, there's our food item. And then over in Rider, let's take a look back at, is it, no, it wasn't that, it was this. Yeah, let's see if we actually catch this. Because we're up and running. I'm gonna actually rerun it. So that's gonna get Nyan Cat running the app again. And there we go. Let's go back into food item. Our other chicken dish is there. So obviously something is saving our data, right? I mean, it's not just disappearing. So I don't know. Like I said, we'll figure that out in a minute. I just want to see if we actually get to our break point. So I'm going to say uh, yellow squash here. I've also got to quit saying that. I got to quit saying what I'm typing. I'm not ty I'm say I'm typing it, not saying it. So anyway, and then I'm going to type in... Uh, Gil Gilgamesh, is that a person? I don't know, or a mythical creature, whatever. And we're gonna say it's gluten-free just to do it. And then there, that did not get us to our break point though. Nope. So add, add food item, maybe here. Do I have to execute a certain way? I don't know. Oh, maybe just populate table. I mean, that's definitely happening, right? So let's, oh yeah, let's do this. And then instead of running it, we're gonna debug it. That's, I bet you that's why that didn't happen. Whoa, what is this? Oh, the cert's not trusted. We, that's fine, accept it. All right, so then food items. And we'll do some chicken wings, lots of chicken. Uh, John Smith. And these are, these are gonna be gluten-free chicken wings. There we go, all right, so we get to that. And then let's keep, oh, how do I keep running in here? Four step over, no, just step step over. Yeah, there we go. Then response is null, and the payload. Oh, and let's hover over that and take a look, right? Uh, we got payload, 
in there. Oh yeah, there we go. There's my ID, my name, and my person. False and true. So now this is Okay, I'm a little I'm a little perplexed. Oh no I'm not. I'm not complexed. Because I just realized over here we're doing some work that isn't particularly necessary. We don't have to do this at the client side because I added on the back end the call to the function in the database to create a UUID. But uh we do have the client side making the UUID. So I don't actually know what in means, but new GUID and the GUID makes a type four UUID. So that's why we have this beautiful string right here. And that's fine because the database, if it gets an ID UUID, everything's fine. It'll just take that one instead of creating its own. Um, and then we have chicken wings and John Smith and then the pertinent Boolean values for vegetarian and gluten-free. So that's good. That's what we expected. <laughs> oh, God. So much for my brains. They're gone now. All right. So then back to where are we at here? There we go. Sort of. No. God, how much, how many things do I have open? Any, ah, whatever. Let's go back to this. There we go. There's our break point. So we're there at the payload string. Okay, so we're taking the object here at this point and we're gonna serialize it is what's happening. So it's turning in the, the object, the .NET object into a JSON object. So we're gonna step over that. So now payload string, I believe, should be, oh, can I not, can I not look at it? That, uh, well, that's weird. Okay. What happens if I just hover over it? Usually you can do this. Hover over it and it should show. No, it's just gonna, it's just gonna blink. Okay. So anyway, it's got the payload string. And then here, what I believe is occurring is, so the client, which is created and instantiated up here as an object, it gets the base URL, which is from the top, whoops, this, from this right here. So we're going against this active URL and we're going to make a client call out to that URL at that base address and we're going to pass the payload string which is the JSON object that was just created from the uh, blah, 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 the serializing of the payload which is the .NET object right here called food item. That sounds really complicated when I say it out loud. But basically, we're just taking the .NET object, turning it into JSON so we can send it to the URI endpoint via an HTTP request. That, it is actually kind of complicated now that I see it. There's multiple steps here. Anyway, we could probably refactor that and make it look like one nice little clean call. From there, we got what then? We await the post call, which is an asynchronous call out to the HTTP endpoint via post. Here, let's go down and run into that. So, boom, that happened. Oh, and here's our populate table task. So what's going on there? Oh, this is where now, what I suspect we're getting, because that was done. Um, here's another, another wait and see. I think it should just be filling up our table though with a new value. Yeah, there we go, yellow squash. But did it, so it did that and then it just stopped in here. Hmm. So anyway, that's populating the table. So what happened over here, though, was we went we went to do this post async. I don't think did we get here? I didn't think we. Oh, I guess we got to await populate table. But then, where is added an item at? I don't see where that populated. Let's see here. Uh oh, <laughs> I guess we are talking about food, aren't we? Um, yeah, that does it for some people. I, uh, I'm a lucky soul. I seem to be able to eat pretty much everything. 
Um, unless penicillin's a food, then I'm in deep shit if penicillin is a food because that stuff makes me loopy. But yeah, gluten gets a lot of people these days, it seems. Um, which is unfortunate. It's uh, in beer and bread, and those are pretty prominent foods. Yeah, yeah, it's the it's an item in the thing. <laughs> oh, I know quite a few people, and it also seems to be just a trend too. Like some people just don't like gluten. Period. They don't like gluteny stuff. You know, they're not into beer, not into bread. Uh, and for the most part, for most humans, it seems better if you just kind of eat a little a little bit of protein, not a lot, a little bit of protein and and veggies. Like honestly, humans do really well eating veggies. I'm sure a lot of meat eaters don't want to hear that, but. All things being considered, veggies tend to be the uh, core food that any human can eat a reasonable quantity of and stay alive in a healthy sense. But I digress. Code. So at this point, I, I feel like I've gotten enough done to kind of hand off with reasonable expectation that my buddy Jeremy is going to be able to knock this out in like five minutes probably. He's definitely more familiar with uh, blazer. I've come in here and I've figured a little bit about what's going on just from these function calls. But he's going to be able to take that server and attach those and we're going to put together a stream in the, in the very near future and talk more about not just running it locally like I just did. Which, great way to get started, great way to go through some development tasks, just running this stuff locally, getting familiar with it. But we're going to also talk about getting it deployed out to Azure and getting all these things running in the cloud so you can have everything not on your local machine but out in the cloud where you can provide your production list of what food the family's going to bring to your dinner table or you know to the family's dinner table <laughs> so anyway i hope everybody's enjoyed that and found it at least somewhat useful i will have more coming at you real soon but for now that is oh, let's let's delete my other chicken dish real quick See if I can do that now that I've stopped the server. Oh, no, it says we deleted it. Because I imagine this page, once it's active, it's making those calls directly over to the server, which is cool. But anyway, I will be sending all that information of what we've just worked through over to Jeremy, and then we will be back on either his stream or my stream or the Hasura stream or the Azure and the Hasura stream. We're going to be all over the place, and we're going to show you how to put all this together to make it live using the serverless tools, the function calls, etc., to get it done, get it built, and get it deployed out there into production. In the meantime, everybody have a thrashing kick-ass day, and I'm going to play some guitar and do not coding for a little bit, and I'll catch you all the next time I'm on the stream. Loco TV, thanks for hosting, thanks for joining. Uh, Viable Clan member, as always, good to see you. Thanks for the inputs. Uh, and yes, the Nyan Cat plug-in gang. I am definitely part of the Nyan Cat gang. Uh, I got that on everything. I found out that there's even some other places in the JetBrains IDEs where you can get that, and I'm trying to figure out where you can get the Nyan Cat in uh, Visual Studio Code. I bet we both know somebody that knows a lot about getting it into Visual Studio Code, considering they're super into Nyan Cats, but also Nyan Corgi. <laughs> so all that stuff's coming at you, and I will, I will bring it to you as soon as possible. In the meantime, as I was saying, going to play some guitar. Happy Thrashing Code. Y'all have a good one. Cheerio.